Welcome to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. As a veteran senior pastor, Dr. Sullivan understands the importance of Bible teaching in the spiritual growth and development of God's people. Dr. Sullivan's method of teaching the Bible is to read and carefully explain each chapter and verse in clear and understandable terms so the student of the Bible gains the full understanding of God's Word. Now prepare yourself to learn and grow as Dr. Sullivan teaches through the Bible. Hello, and welcome to another session of Teaching Through the Bible. I'm Dr. Kenneth Sullivan. In this session, we'll be studying the book of Ephesians chapter 4. So let's jump right in and begin. I'm reading, as usual, from the New International Version. We're in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have, you have received. Be completely humble, gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, being a Christian comes with the responsibility to live a godly lifestyle, a godly Christ-like lifestyle. True Christians are imitators of Christ. God expects us to live lives that are worthy of our calling to be Christians, and that's what Paul is emphasizing here. Throughout this chapter, Paul spells out how Christians should live. He begins by commanding us to be completely humble. Humility is a goal that we have to work for. We have to set it for ourselves, and we have to work toward it. Our natural inclination as human beings is to be proud. Even shy people are proud. As a matter of fact, some shy people are more proud than, than extroverted people. So we have to be very intentional about practicing humility. And here are a few suggestions to, to help you practice living a humble lifestyle. First of all, don't brag or boast over your possessions and accomplishments. I taught that to my children even when they were little babies, when they were young and just starting to learn how to, to walk and talk. We taught them, my wife and I taught them, don't be a boaster or a bragger. Don't brag over your accomplishments or the things that you have. Be thankful to God for everything that you have because everything that we have belongs to God. Acknowledge God as the giver of everything you are and of everything you possess. That's number two. Um, every day go before God and give him thanks for all of the things he's done in your life and all the things he's accomplished. Acknowledge him as being the one who, who gives all of these good and perfect gifts. Uh, thirdly, I would say build a relationship, build friendships and relationships with people who have little influence and little money, people who may be poor or what the world might style as ordinary. Uh, the Bible says this in Romans 12, 16 in the New Living Translation, don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Again, that's Romans 12, 16. Uh, fourthly, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Uh, keep a humble estimation of yourself. Now, some people will say that that's low self-esteem, but I say that it's humility. And the Bible says that it's humility to humble yourself and not to think more, uh, more of yourself than you ought to. Uh, we ought to have confidence, but our confidence can't be in ourselves because we are so flawed. Our confidence has to be in God. So we want to learn to place our confidence in God rather than self. And then once we have our confidence placed squarely on the Lord, then we can live according to the scripture that says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Not relying on our own feeble strength, but uh, relying on the strength of God. The Bible says that, uh, that uh, those who will die, those who are proud will die and they'll leave everything because they rely on their own feeble strength. Their hopes die with them. The Bible says that in Proverbs. God resists the proud. The Bible tells us this in James chapter 4. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, in addition to practice, practicing humility, Paul tells us that Christians should practice being gentle and kind and not harsh and abrasive. 
We have to resist the impulse to lash out and be harsh and rude and abrasive and instead practice kindness and and gentleness in our words and in our actions. There is a natural inclination for a, a lot of us, if not most of us, to uh, react to certain situations harshly and rudely. Um, but take a deep breath, stop and realize and remember who you are, who you're representing, that you're an ambassador for Christ, uh, and then practice kindness. The Bible said that we should not repay wrong for wrong. No one should do that. No Christian should do that. So um, our demeanor should be a demeanor of gentleness and kindness. That's what we're aspiring to. Uh, none of us have gotten there completely yet, but we're working toward. We're at different stages along the process. And so um, we don't just leave this to chance. This is something that we have to be very determined and deliberate about. Paul also commands us to be patient bearing with one another in love, he says. We should put up with each other's faults knowing that we also have faults. Now, we're not as aware of our own faults as we are of other people's faults, but we have to turn inwardly and we have to focus in, inwardly and analyze and examine ourselves and realize that we have some pretty glaring faults when you come right down to it. And, uh, and people have to put up with us. So we have to learn how to be patient with other people, uh, realizing that we also have faults. Jesus is our example of humility and gentleness and patience and kindness. He is our pattern, if you will. He is our role model. Our goal is to be like Jesus. Now, verse 3 commands us to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That is, we are to practice living and working in peace and unity. We have to make it an effort. We have to think about it beforehand. That person who irritates you, think about it before you get to work, how you're going to make, create a plan and a strategy of, of how you're going to overcome that with kindness and with goodness and, and uh, ask God to give you the strength not to retaliate. We should magnify as far as unity is concerned and the bond of, of peace, we should magnify and celebrate the things that we agree on with people um, and the things that we have in common with other people. And we should minimize the things that we differ on and the things we differ on and, and try to work through those things. So uh, very often, too often, we magnify our disagreements. We just let them get blown all out of proportion, little things. Uh, can cause us to go off the handle and go off the deep end because in our minds, they're big things. They're just little minutia, little small, minute things that uh, irritate us that we can let fester and grow. We need to minimize those things in our mind. That is, make them smaller. We need to shrink them down to where they are um, uh, and and not uh, maximize them, not blow them out of, out of proportion. Um, so we should do the opposite of what it is our natural inclination to do. We should focus on and celebrate all the things that we agree on and work uh, to peacefully resolve the things that we disagree on. The Bible says this in Proverbs 12, 16, and, I'm, and, and this is the New Living Translation that I'm, I'm quoting. Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent Overlook an insult. That's Proverbs 12, 16 again. And I'll repeat it. Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. So, you know, I bear that in mind when, when I get angry and I'm about to explode or I'm about to say something that I uh, that's harsh or abrasive to people, that passage comes to my mind that I'm getting ready to act like a fool uh, and, and nobody wants to be a fool. We want to be wise as serpents, a wise as serpents, and, and the Bible says harmless as doves. Now, verses four through six, I'm reading. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, uh, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Okay? So understanding the oneness of of the body of Christ is critical. We are one worldwide 
universal church, we the believers, we who are Christian, uh, we who embrace the teachings of Christ and follow them. There are many Christian denominations and independent churches, but they are all part of one body. The fact that we are one worldwide body in Christ must overwhelm and outweigh all of the petty differences that exist among us, okay? Our differences are swallowed up by oneness. We have to remember that. So uh, regardless of what your denomination is, you may call yourself Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist, Church of God in Christ, or anything else. But if you believe and practice the essentials of the Christian faith, we are part of one universal worldwide church. So um, I'm a member of the Church of God in Christ. I'm a member of the, the Baptist Church on the corner. Even though uh, personally I may not attend that church and my name may not be on the roll, we are one, okay? Uh, we are one. I'm a member of the Methodist Church. Those who, who embrace Christ, those who embrace the tenets of the Christian faith, they're my brothers and sister in, sisters in Christ all over the world. And that's how God wants us to think. God wants us to think universally and not just locally. God wants us to think uh, in, a, in an area of unity unilaterally and not, and, and not just uh, individually. Uh, for true Christians, there's only one Lord. Uh, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one faith. That's the Christian faith. There's only one baptism. That's baptism into the, into the body of Christ. There's only one hope. That's the blessed hope of eternal life that we all share. Uh, that life with God in eternity and with each other in the new heaven and the new earth. That is the blessed hope. New bodies that we'll have. And uh, we will be perfected in Christ. That's the hope that every Christian should carry in their heart. So, we are one in Christ. And I believe that as we're approaching the end of time, that God is tearing down denominational walls. My constant prayer is that he'll tear down this foolishness called racial walls, and that he will destroy all of those things that, uh, that we magnify, that divide us, and that God will bring us together as one and that we'll have a common understanding. Uh, we may not ever be members of the same denomination, but we will be able to accept each other. Even our differences in opinion uh, about uh, non-essential things, as long as we agree on the essentials, that Jesus Christ uh, is the Son of God, that he came to earth in, in, in human form, that he died on the cross to pay for our, our sins, and that uh, we receive salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are some of the basic things that we must believe as Christians to be one. And so we are one in Christ Jesus. And we believe that we have to follow Christ. We have to be believers in him. And, and that uh, faith is evidenced through the way that we conduct ourselves. Now I'm reading verses seven through 10. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Now, Christ descended from heaven to earth. And after his resurrection, he ascended back to heaven. Now, John 13, uh, 3 and 13 tells us that. Uh, it confirms that. And it says, no one has ascended to heaven, that is, gone up to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. Okay? So Jesus Christ first descended to the earth. And then after he uh, died and was resurrected, and he spent uh, um, a number of days here, nearly two months, uh, here, then he ascended back to heaven. Now, when Paul speaks of Christ descending to the lower parts of the earth, he could be speaking of the fact that Christ was born 
and lived and worked among the common people, the very poor people, the, the, among the lowest on the rungs of society, the, low, the lowly people. And he descended to the bottom rungs of society, all the way from heaven, all the way down, not only to earth, but all the way down to the bottom rungs of society on earth. He was born in a stable and, uh, and he was placed in an animal trough, a feeding trough um, as, as, his, uh, as his crib. Uh, and so he was poor and he lived his life among the poor. The common people heard him gladly. So uh, Jesus descended to the earth and possibly to the lower uh, rungs of society on the earth. That's, that's one way of looking at it. Now there are, there's another possibility and, and some scholars take this position um, they believe that G when it says that Jesus um, uh, descended into the lower parts of the earth, that, that he went to the abode of the dead. That is, he went uh, uh, into uh, Hades and he preached to the spirits that were in prison. Some scholars hold this view and, and they cite uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, which says, So he went and preached to the spirits in prison those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. That's 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. Okay, so there, there are two opinions about this uh, uh, passage that says he went into the lower part of the earth. So um, uh, pay your money and make your choice. Now, in verse 8, Paul says, Christ took many captives when he ascended, and he gave gifts to men. This simply means he conquered Satan and the demonic world, okay? Now, it was a custom in the ancient, especially the Roman world, that when one kingdom conquered another, some of the conquered people were taken captive. They, those who survived, those who uh, were taken captive, uh, they were brought back to the, to the city. Um, of the conqueror, and and there would be a uh, a parade. The uh, the victor would parade down through the the main street of the city, and uh, they would uh, at the end, the very end of the parade, they would there would be the captives in tr in chains, and they would be uh, being displayed and humiliated uh, to represent their utter defeat. This is how Christ defeated Satan and the demon world. Paul is using this ancient military custom to illustrate uh, what Jesus did to Satan and, and the, the demon world. When a, when, a, when a kingdom was conquered, all their possessions were, were taken by the victor and divided up among his troops and among others. So Christ conquered Satan and his hordes. Uh, and then he gave gifts to those who had been dominated by Satan and the demon world. But the gifts that Christ gave did not come from Satan. Uh, the gifts that Christ gave comes from God. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. It is handed down to the Father of, uh, from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, no no changing, um, um, no no uh, shifting in Him. So Christ gave these gifts to men, to those who are His followers. He gave Christians the gifts that uh, that we would use to continue to spread the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and continue to advance the kingdom of God. Um, Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 in the New Living Translation says this, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So through his resurrection, his death, uh, through his death on the cross, Christ paid for the sins of humanity and he brought forgiveness of those sins for all who would believe. Then he rose from the dead, completing the victory over sin and death, and he gives that victory to all who believe. Okay, so we have the, the gifts of God, we have forgiveness of sins, uh, we have salvation, eternal life, and all of the good things that God has given. And then he gave us these gifts. 
Now I'm reading verses 11 through 13, and we'll look at what the gifts were that uh, are that he gives to us. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, here Paul lists the gifts that Christ gave to his followers. These are commonly referred to as the fivefold ministry gifts. First of all, he gave the gift of apostle. Um, the gift of the apostle is to preach, to teach, to establish churches, and to oversee them and appoint uh, someone over them. So the apostles have, apostles have those, those gifts, and, and the early apostles had the gift of working miracles to confirm the word. And certainly, uh, I believe that miracles still exist in the church and in the world. Um, we don't see as much of it in, in this country, but I believe that there will be a great resurgence of it as we get closer to the end of the, of the age. The, uh, the original 12 apostles um, saw Jesus and were given the power to work miracles. And, and their job was to lay the foundation of the church with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. Then Paul, um, uh, now aside from these uh, 12 apostles that Jesus appointed that are listed in the Bible, there are other apostles. Uh, Jane, the half-brother of Jesus, um, was an apostle. He was a also the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He was an apostle. You can find that in Galatians 1.19. Barnabas was an apostle. You can find that in Acts 14.14. 14. Paul was, a, was an apostle, and you can find that in, in most of his epistles. He stated at the beginning of his epistles that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then Apollos was an apostle in 1 Corinthians 4 and 6 through 9. Now, after mentioning the apostles, Paul lists the gift of prophet, the second one in the list of ministry gifts. Prophets are those with a special gift to proclaim the very words of God. Prophets may also be used to foretell things that will happen in the future, but this is not very common in our day. And again, I believe there'll be a resurgence in those things as we get closer to, to, the, uh, to the return of Christ. Now, if a person is claiming to be a prophet and they make a prediction and it does not come to pass, the Bible said that that person is not a prophet. They are a false prophet. The Bible says this, and this is in Deuteronomy chapter 18. But any prophet who falsely claims to speak in my name or who speaks in the name of other God, of another God must die. If the prophet speaks in the Lord's name, but his prediction does not happen or come true, you will know that the Lord did not give that message. That prophet has spoken without any authority and need to be and need not be feared. That's Deuteronomy 18, 20, and 21 in the New Living Translation. Many, if not most of the people claiming to be prophets and prophetesses today, only tell people what they want to hear. They say things like, This is your year to prosper. They say things like, God is turning everything around for you. They, they give all of these rosy predictions and these blanket statements to whole congregations of people, um, but they just say what people want to hear. And, and I'm, I'm leery of that. And uh, um, uh, I believe that there are still prophets today, genuine bona fide prophets. There are still genuine bona fide prophetesses today. Uh, but I believe that there is a, a cultural thing that is happening in our day where people are, uh, are calling themselves prophets and prophetesses, and they're saying all sorts of things that are not verified or verifiable. So um, I, I'm, I'm leery of that, um, and I think that we should be careful to use the scriptures to, um, to identify people for what they are and what they are not. Now, ancient prophets put their lives on the line and confronted kings and others who had authority 
uh, to have them killed, to put them to death. So prophets, prophecy was not a game to them. It was, it was laying their lives on the line. Prophets do speak words of edification. Now, uh, everything that prophet says is not doom and gloom because prophets do speak to people for edification, for exhortation, and for comfort. And that's found in 1 Corinthians 14, 13, uh, those who prophesy. Um, but they don't just make blanket promises of prosperity like uh, we hear so often today. Uh, so I think that everything should be borne out in Scripture. Paul also mentions the ministry gift of evangelists. Evangelists have the gift of uh, uh, and calling to preach the gospel and bring people to Christ. Their primary calling is to compel people to come to salvation. That's the passion and the gift of the evangelist. Then Paul mentions the ministry gift of the pastor. Um, that's the most common ministry, one of the most common ministries that we see today. The job and calling of the pastor is to shepherd God's people. They're called to oversee, feed, and care for the people of God. Pastors have the job of preaching and teaching and caring for the flock of God. And then finally, number five, Paul mentioned the ministry gift of the teacher. Teachers teach the word of God. They have the gift uh, of being able to read and explain the scriptures in a way that is clear and simple to understand. Um, a teacher's goal is not to stir the emotions of people, but to bring a clear understanding of the word of God. Okay. So that's my primary ministry gift is uh, to teach. I'm, I'm a teacher and I, Originally, God called me to be a pastor teacher, uh, and I still um, pastor pastors. I, I oversee and encourage and help and empower pastors. But uh, the primary gift that I use today is, is the gift of, of a teacher, and I'm, I'm happy with that, and I'm satisfied with that. Now, the job of all these ministry gifts is to equip God's people for works of service by teaching and showing and urging and leading and building up and training the people of God. And then Paul said, until we all come to the unity of the faith, to that maturity, to where, to where we've come to the fullness of the measure of the statue of Christ. That is, until we've grown all the way up, until we're um, as mature as Christ, or we're, we're completely Christ-like. Now, that has not happened. So since that has not happened, I believe that these five-fold ministry gifts are still in operation today, bringing us up to the fullness of the measure of the, of the stature of Christ. Now, the goal is to help the saints to grow to a state of Christian maturity. Maturity is exhibited by uh, faith and knowledge and peace and unity and Christ-like conduct and character. Now, uh, we are growing, we're becoming more and more like Christ if we're doing the things that he told us, told us to do. Um, but I think that all of us will admit that we've got some more growing to do. Now I'm going to read verses 14 through 16. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceit in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every aspect, every respect, the mature body of whom, uh, of him who is the head, that is Christ. For him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now, one defining sign of maturity is stability. Now, I told you that the ministry gifts, that their job is to help us to grow to a full maturity, to the full maturity of being like Christ. One of the definite signs of maturity is stability based on knowledge of the truth. Unstable people are immature and vulnerable to deception. They're not sure what they believe, so they can be carried away by false doctrine, that is, false teaching that sounds good. They go this way, and they go that way. If this sounds good, 
They're always following the latest thing. That's an unstable person. They can't stay in one place. They jump from one church to another church. They stay here for a season. Now, now in, 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 in this day and age, we've gotten this word season. Uh, when I was coming up, you got in a church, and, and if the pastor was moral and he was uh, teaching the word of God and living right, the leadership was good, you stayed in that church. Uh, now, people go and stay for a season. They stay here for a season. Uh, I'm here for a year this year. Uh, I'm here for two or three years. And then I move to the next church and then I move to that. And then, then to something exciting over here. So they run over there. So that's instability. Uh, I believe that if a church is a good church and the pastor is a, a good man, if he is a moral man and, and he is, a, is teaching the word of God and leading the people of God, and he has the heart of God, we should stay and help him build that thing. Okay. Um, so instability, um, people who don't know the word of God are, are, uh, movable. They don't stay stable. Paul reminds us that Christ is the supp supplier of everything the body needs to grow and build itself in love as each part does its own work. Okay. So stability is the mark of maturity and the aim of the ministry gifts. And the aim of Christ is to grow us up to a place to where uh, we're not carried away with every wind of doctrine. I should mention that uh, immature people don't know what is true and what is not true. They, they're uncertain and um, uh, because they don't take the time to really study. Uh, they don't come to Bible study like they should. They don't uh, attend church like they should. They're unstable and they, they will never be mature as long as they do this. As long as, as long as you will not make a commitment to go to learn, to read your Bible, to study and pray, you're going to struggle with immaturity. But when you get to the place to where you prioritize learning, you prioritize, you make it, a, you discipline yourself to read the Word of God. You discipline yourself to attend Bible church and Bible study faithfully. Um, you discipline yourself to be a student of the Word. Then you're going to grow and you're going to mature, and you're not going to be easily fooled by things that just sound good. Now, verses 17 through 19. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to, to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. So. Paul gives us more details regarding how we are to live our lives as Christians and as uh, in regard to how we're not to live. He says, don't act like Gentile. Now, Gentiles are non-Jews. The Jewish people had the knowledge of God. They had the, uh, the oracles of God, that is the Ten Commandments and the Law and the Prophets. And so they prided themselves on their knowledge of God and they lived a different way from Gentiles who believed in all kinds of different gods, non-Jews, many of our ancestors. Uh, they worshiped idols and they did all kinds of, of ungodly things and they had really no knowledge of God. They were confused, okay? So Paul is saying, don't live like the Gentiles. In other words, today we would just say, don't live like unbelievers, uh, those who have no regard for God. Gentiles were regarded as Jews, as unbelievers, and most of them were. So Paul said, don't think like they think. Don't believe like they believe. They believe false things. Uh, they believe in witchcraft. And, uh, they believe in superstition. They believe in idol gods. And unbelievers are separated from God and, and full of false ideas and notions. They believe in false gods. They, they believe in evolution. They believe in no God. Okay, so many are atheists. Um, so they've lost, Paul said, all sensitivity because they hardened their hearts against God's will. They no longer have an, uh, any idea of what pleases the one true God. They've given themselves over to what pleases their physical senses. They give in to their sensual desires, whether they are right or wrong. And Paul mentions that they're giving themselves over to greed. And we see that in America, that people will do almost anything for a dollar. And it's not just rich people, there are poor people who are greedy. 
Um, they're just, um, their priority is a dollar bill and, and that's their God. That's, that's greed. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of the things that you need, all of these things will be added unto you. That's our priority as the people of God has to be God, not making money, not uh, chasing our career, God first, and then everything else below that. Um, so people do what pleases their flesh with little thought or regard about what God has to say about it. That's the life of an unbeliever. So Paul said, don't act like that. Don't be like that. Now I'm reading verses 20 through 24. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So the Christian life is not at all like that of the unbelievers. Christ teaches us to pull off that old way of living and adopt a brand new a way of, of living and thinking, a brand new lifestyle, and to be made new in the attitude of our mind. Now, the way that we are made new in the attitude of our mind is by constantly feeding our mind the things of God. We need to hear the word, listen to it. Uh, you can go on the internet and, and hear the word of God preached. You can go be careful about some of the stuff that you listen to because it's all kind of crazy stuff on there. You can go to Christian radio and get some good teaching. You go to, uh, to church by all means, and I emphasize and reemphasize that um, Bible study, uh, and and just make it your determination to renew your mind with the Word of God. Now we're commanded to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's what Paul said. Now listen to what Paul wrote to the Ephesian Christians. Here's what he said. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. That's Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 in the New Living Translation. Now, I'm reading verses 25 through 29. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who had been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, here, Paul is giving us some more details on how to live the Christian life. First of all, number one, <clears throat> stop lying and start being truthful. And Paul mentions the fact that we are all one in Christ. Don't, don't lie to your brothers and sisters in Christ, and don't, don't lie in the world. Just if, you're, if you've been a liar all your life and you practice lying, then here's the place to stop. Now you say you're a Christian. Now it's time to stop lying, okay? Stop lying. And then number two, when you get angry, don't sin. Now we're going to get angry. You know, that, that's part of our nature. Things are going to make us angry. But be careful that while you're angry, don't sin. And don't stay angry more than one day, Paul, uh, Paul says. Now, Paul is speaking, of course, by the unction of the Holy Spirit. He's being moved by the Holy Spirit to write us these things. So this is Paul speaking, but he's just the mouthpiece. He's just the instrument that God is using. So God is making these demands of us. So stop stealing and, and then stop uh, flying into a rage when you get angry and breaking up stuff and cussing and and fighting, and don't nurse that anger. And Paul says, get over it in one day. God gives you a full day to get angry. 
Um, in one translation, don't let, says, don't let the sun go down with you still angry. Okay, that's the end of a day uh, when you come down to sundown. So you can be angry. You can nurse a grudge for one full day. Technically, you're given that permission. But at the end of that, make it right. Apologize. Do what you need to do to get rid of that. Don't nurse that anger because the Bible says it gives the devil a foothold. Then he says, if you're a thief, stop stealing. Get a job and work so you can share with those who are in need. God is always thinking about more than just us, and he wants us to think about more than just us. Get a job and work, stop stealing, and then you'll have enough to meet your needs, and you'll have enough to share with other people. Then in verse 29, Paul commands Christians to clean up our language. Don't use profanity. Don't engage in gossip and slander. Use your tongue to, to build people up rather than tear them down. That's what we're called to do. Proverbs 10 and 20, uh, 10 and 20 and 21 says, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The lips of the righteous nourish many, okay? So our tongue and our lips should be used to build people up and to nourish them and to encourage them and to strengthen them, not tear them down. Um, don't use the members of Christ to, uh, to blaspheme and curse and, and do all of those kinds of ungodly things. Instead, as Christians, we ought to begin to use our, our mouths our, in a positive way. Understand that your calling as a Christian is is to bless people, not curse them. When you curse people, you're doing what Satan wants you to do, not what God wants you to do, okay? So I know that there are a lot of cursing Christians today, and, and that's bad. That's not good. It's a bad testimony. It's a bad witness. It hinders your life. So um, start working on that and, and just ask God to help you and turn away from it. Now, verse 30 says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, we grieve the Holy Spirit by sinning and ignoring uh, the Holy Spirit's leading and guidance, okay? When we know what is right and we don't do it, and we know what is wrong and we do it anyway, the Holy Spirit is grieved over that. So we want to um, walk in in harmony with the Spirit, and follow His leading and yield uh, to His demands in our life. Now, when we do what's wrong, uh, when this happens, we need to repent by going before God in prayer and confessing that sin, turning from it, and asking God for forgiveness and the strength to resist the sin. Now, in some cases, when a sin is really a stubborn one, we need to go to our pastor, our leader, and we may need to confess that thing to them and ask them to, to help us, to hold us accountable, to pray for us, and, and to, to help us to overcome that sin. Now I'm reading verses 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, slander, uh, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you, okay? So now God calls us to make a complete turnaround when we become Christians. You can't continue down the same path you've been going. When you become a Christian, you make a complete turnaround and you begin to live differently. You begin to struggle against sin. You begin to struggle against the, the desires of your own flesh, okay? So it's a war that's going on once you become a Christian. War begins with your own self, your own mind. You have to feed your mind the right thoughts. You have to make demands upon your body that you didn't make before. And God will help you. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Now, where we used to harbor bitterness and resentment and, and rage and malice, we have to let go of all of that stuff. Just throw it away and begin to live the new life that Christ is calling us for. Uh, we can no longer be brawlers ready to cuss and fuss and fight at the drop of a hat. We are called to be people of peace and to be peacemakers. We are to release the malice and the slander and all the negativity and begin practicing kindness and compassion. 
And then we're to practice forgiveness because remember now, Christ has forgiven us and Christ is still forgiving us of stuff that we are doing that we shouldn't do. So we can't um, afford to hold unforgiveness over other people when we got to go down on our knees before God and ask him to forgive us of the things that we do. Christians are commanded to make radical changes in our lifestyle from the old way we used to live to this new way of life. That's the way we shine. We shine through our righteousness. But remember, we have help from God. The Bible makes this clear when it says this, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. But God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. That's Philippians 2, 12 and 13 in the New Living Translation. Change requires hard work and effort with God's help. Now, we can do it with the help of God. God is in the process of changing us from glory to glory to glory. But it's hard work, and it requires effort even with God's help. We can change, and we can walk worthy of the name of Christ and the calling of Christ if we draw from the Holy Spirit, if we stay in the Word of God, if we're faithful in our, in our church attendance and Bible study, if we do all of those things that God tells us to do, he'll give us strength. Now, sometimes you will fail, but don't wallow in your failure and your self-pity. Get up, repent, get back in the fight to change, okay? It's a fight to change. Keep at it. You'll find yourself becoming more and more like Christ. Well, that brings us to the close of Ephesians chapter 4. Next time, we'll cover each Ephesians chapter 5. I want to thank you, and God bless you until our next session. Thank you for tuning in to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. We hope this program has benefited you in your Christian walk. For a free download of this program and to browse Dr. Sullivan's books, videos, and audio titles, visit our website at EmergeCurriculum.com. Please tune in to our next teaching session on Vision Stream Network or listen on demand from our podcast.